Hey everybody, how's it going? My name is Chris and in this video I'm going to show you exactly how to install Cedar Shake siding, so let's get started. And a big thank you to Valspar for sponsoring this video. Alright, so now before we put the Cedar Shake siding on, I'm going to be adding this product called AquaVent. And there's a lot of different products out there and the idea is it forms a little bit of an air barrier behind the cedar shake so if any water does get down there it can travel down and air can move underneath there and dry it out now the cedar siding itself isn't a perfect weather barrier it's just called a cladding it's meant to be on the exterior but it isn't a perfect weather barrier so that's why we have our house wrap up there and we're going to put this on top of it to let air and let that water that gets behind there dry out we're all ready to go i have all my fascia and soffit and trim Put on the building i added a nice piece of painted cedar um, between the siding and what's going to be that cedar shake up there painted that black i have black painted cedar that's around the window up there and then i have the regular cedar natural color trim going all around the inside tops of that gambrel shape up there and we're ready to put this on and then we're going to do our layouts for our courses and start running the cedar so let's get started If you're new to the channel, I primarily make woodworking videos, but I also do videos like this that are home improvement and kind of DIY things. This is my new dream shop and my wife and I sold our house and we're going to be living in that upstairs where the cedar siding is going over the next couple years while we build our dream house. So feel free to subscribe and follow along on other shop projects as I finish this and the rest of our journey and for some cool woodworking videos too. All right, so I got my aqua vent up there. We're ready to put the cedar shake siding or the cedar shingles on there. And I want to explain to you what I'm using a little bit first. I'm using a western red cedar, and this is different, obviously, than the eastern white cedar that you'll typically see on the east coast. And a lot of times out there on the east coast, you'll see them put those on raw or natural or unfinished and let them bleach out, and they kind of turn a really nice, pretty silver gray color. They also will pre-stain those eastern uh, white cedar shingles with what they call a bleaching oil. And that kind of just accelerates that um, grain color and blends it out really nicely. And you can also buy these cedar shingles with whatever color paint or stain on them already. Now what I did was I stained mine using this Valspar transparent one coat exterior stain and sealant. Now Valspar is sponsoring this video, I've used this same stuff before on my deck that I stained a couple years ago had really really good results with it so I'm really confident in using it again and that was on a horizontal surface the deck that's walked on it held up really really well that was a semi-transparent finish this is a transparent finish the more solids the more trans the less transparent the finish is the less durable it is so if you your semi transparents are going to be a little more durable last a little longer and then your full solid stains are going to last the longest but this transparent stain has a four-year guarantee on decks horizontal surfaces and a six-year guarantee on fencing and siding so that's really really good and then in six years five six years if it's looking weathered up there, I can go back up there and recode it. Now what I did was I dipped all these and then back brushed them individually so that I got some stain on both sides. Now that'll help keep the wood preserved a little bit longer um, and it's not gonna cause the wood to expand and contract differently on the front and the back. Similar to finishing a tabletop, you wanna put finish on the top and the bottom of the tabletop so that moisture that's entering the wood isn't entering unevenly on one side and causing it to cup and bow um, and it'll it'll expand and contract uniformly so that's why I did that in the back since it's not going to see the sun and not going to see too much rain or water there still might be moisture that gets under behind there that's why we have that aqua vent up there to dry that out but that'll last the lifetime I don't have to pull those off and reseal it I can just periodically reseal the front and it's gonna last a long, long time. You can also leave Western Red Cedar natural as well. And this will sometimes bleach out, sometimes it'll get dark and brown. That's kind of the, one of the really cool things about cedar is letting it do its own thing and get its natural patina and color. But because I have the dark garage, the slate color siding and the black trim, I wanted that 
nice warm contrast of the wood. So that's why I'm sealing it and trying to keep it that brown color. Now to use, to adhere these shingles to the wall up there, I'm gonna be using nothing but stainless steel. Now you can use galvanized if it's underneath the shingles where it's not gonna get water, but you still have a chance that when water over time, if it happens to get behind there and hit that galvanized, there is a chance that it'll stain and start streaking. Stainless steel is your safest option. I'm gonna be using a medium crown stapler. Medium crown means around half inch to 7 16 inch uh, crown. You can use also use nails, um, different nailers. Look up and see what the recommended uh, type of nailer, but I'm using stainless steel staples where all those will be covered underneath each course. And then for the sides, because I have to cut the angles and I won't be able to hide those, I'll be using a, a small stainless steel nail that has a brownish colored paint to match the siding so you won't really be able to see those. So we'll hop up there. I'll show you a little bit more about the layout, where I'm nailing, got to keep spacing along the edges and between each course and how I laid that out so I get even courses uh, between each one of the, the windows and those vents and how you think about that and lay that all out. So let's get up there and start putting some shingles on. All right, so I want to show you some other general rules of thumb and guidelines that you need to keep in mind when doing cedar siding here. So typically if this was a regular up and down wall and not up in this gambrel angled section here, you could lay out your initial courses and in kind of what they call like a pyramid stack. So you would start with a nice wide one on the bottom and kind of go up and then you can lay out four, five, or six depending on how wide your pieces are at a time on your corner and then you can work in and now you can work in from both sides and it's actually better to do that when you get towards the middle you can switch out your shingles in between that middle there and get them to line up just perfectly you don't have to run all the way across start on the left and work all the way right you can meet in the middle now for here i'm starting with this angle so what i'm going to do is cut my first course and your first course needs to be a double course too and that means you have two overlapping on the very bottom since they're as you go up you'll always have at least one extra course underneath as you go up but that first course doesn't have that that's why you need to double it up and something that's important to consider on the very bottom if this was the bottom of your house and you had your foundation underneath that you want to drop your shingles about half inch maybe three quarters of an inch underneath the outside the top of the sheathing that's on the outside of your wall so you're probably your osb or whatever so that when water comes down that forms a little drip edge and the water doesn't come back up and around and use capillary action and get up in there and rot out your osb now what you want to do to do that you have your first two courses here your front course should hang down about a quarter of an inch past quarter of an inch to half inch past your first course that's on there so your outside course there what i'm going to do here is i have this piece of trim separating my metal siding and my cedar and i have a drip cap here now my first course i'm going to have it three quarters inch three quarters of an inch up from that and my second course which will be a quarter of an inch below that will hang down and give me about half of an inch clearance you want that half of an inch clearance so that water doesn't sit between the two if it was sitting smack right on there water would just sit right there and cause that cedar to prematurely rot so you give it a little bit of a area to breathe and so that when water gets to the edge of that shingle it'll drip and fall and make its way all the way down the siding and everything else now a couple other considerations here is you want to make sure that when you're nailing or stapling that you're three quarters to one inch away from each side. Now if it's a shingle that is 10 inches wide or wider, you'll add two additional nails or staples an inch apart in the center of that shingle. You also want to make sure that you're one to two inches above reveal line. So if I have a six inch reveal line, then I want to make sure my nail is at least one to two inches above there. So I'm going to go one and a half. And then you also want to make sure that when you're overlapping, so say this is my 
I have a seam right here. I want to make sure that my seam is one and a half inches from the seam underneath. That's really important too because water is going to get behind that seam and you don't want that capillary action to help it keep finding its way down. Luckily I still have this to prevent any water damage from behind there or water sitting too long, but those are some rules of thumb that you want to consider. You also want to leave, depending on how wet your shingles are, um, an eighth of an inch to a quarter of an inch. Um, if they're really, really wet shingles, that means that they haven't been kiln dried, then they're going to shrink as they dry. So you can have a tighter gap to start with, but then over the seasons, they're going to expand and contract. It's a bad idea to have everything butted up super tight because if they are going to expand during really humid times of the year, you're going to end up with a bunch of buckling, which is definitely not good. So leave an eighth of an inch to a quarter of an inch gap and uh, you'll be good to go. So I'm going to cut these with a handsaw and start laying out my courses. And then I'll show you the story stick that I made to lay out the distance, my reveal face distance, that course um, distance between each course and why I did it that way. So here we go. If you can get yourself a scaffolding, that's definitely the way to go. Something to work off of. The cedar, I have a Japanese saw, works really, really well, it's super accurate. I'm gonna use that to cut this and I can pretty much hold it up here. Cedar's really, really soft and cuts easy. You can also make a layout on the ground of what the angle of your, your stuff is and cut a bunch of them pre-cut a bunch of them that way too. All right, I also want to put this initial three-quarter inch spacer in here for my first course to rest on and then I'll drop that down so that my second course over top of it will be at Half, it, half inch. Right. Down in the description, I added some links to some really good publications and documents put out by both the USDA and some of the Cedar Shake manufacturers that give you exact details and a lot of the stuff that I talk about here on installing these things properly. I also put links to the Valspar paint that I use for the trim, the transparent stain that I use for the cedar, and the brushes that I use to apply both of those. Now I have my first course in place and there's a three quarter inch gap between this drip cap and the bottom of that course. Now I wanna lower that next course down a quarter of an inch and I got a scrap piece of half inch here. I'll set that down to set my courses on. And then now I'm gonna be attaching a string line at the exact height of my show face, which is gonna be six and an eighth inch up to the bottom of the window. And then once we get to the window that'll change a little bit and that's okay to change those a little bit um, to the naked eye if you're changing your courses you start stretching them out or closing them up to meet window edges and door edges or any other pieces you have on there that's okay to do my vents here they are 18 inches so the three courses there are going to be six inches each these are going to be six and eight inch each to meet the bottom of my window down there. And what I did was I measured the distance from the bottom of the window to a half of an inch above this strip cap here. And I made what's called a story stick. On here, you can see I have my half inch line. You might not be able to see it, but I have a half inch line here. And then up from there is one and a six inches or six and an eighth inch all the way up. And that'll meet perfectly. See, it meets underneath there nicely and down there at my window. That means my course will fall beautifully directly underneath the vents and the window. And I made sure the vents 
lined up with that window so that that would happen. You gotta think about those things or you're gonna have kind of some problems. So I'll stick this up there, I'll put a nail in, and that'll tell me how high my show face is, and I'll make sure that when I'm nailing my next course, I'm an inch and a half above that so that none of my nails are exposed. Okay, now that I got my second shingle on on this course, I know these nails are now gonna be hidden. So what I'm gonna do is, I can't get my story stick in here because of the angle of this, but I can safely measure up from the bottom of this half inch spacer. I was able to get my story stick in here, so I have my mark. I'm gonna go ahead and check what that is, six and a quarter. I'm gonna come over here to this shingle and put a mark at six and a quarter here. I'm gonna put a nail in there, and then down on the other end, I'm gonna wrap my stringer all the way across there. Then I can kind of slip my shingles in there, it'll hold in place, I can shuffle them around. When I like where they're at, I can just go right along and zip and uh, nail them all in. Then that'll also give me a guide of what not to nail below. That stringer is gonna be the face. You don't wanna have any nails below that, so I know to go about an inch and a half above that. And then this bottom spacer, put my shingles on top of it and I'll have a nice straight row. And when I move up to the next course, I'm gonna nail my stringer to that line that I just had, that string line, I can snap a line too to give me reference. And that'll be the next bottom of my next course. And then I just move my string up and go all the way up that way and that's how you run these things. All right, I'm out here now on day two and I wanted to show you a couple things. So I did really good on my measurement between the drip cap and the bottom of the window and the bottom of this vent. And you can see how that course is ending perfectly on the bottom of those. <clears throat> and when I laid out my vent, I made sure that my vent was in line with my window so that this would be easy. Now I need to adjust the faces of my vents Sorry for the movement here, I'm hand holding and it's super windy up here. My vent is 16, or I mean 18 inches tall. So I was going courses that were six and an eighth to make it from the drip cap to the bottom of the window. But now I need to adjust those to just six inches so that my next two courses here end up flush at the top of that. And then when I get over, carry that all the way over to the window, I need to measure from where that top row on the vent ends on that window, measure to the top about a quarter inch or a half inch above that drip cap on top of the window and do some math there to figure out what size courses, you know, and try to stay right around six inches, plus or minus half of an inch or so. I actually ended up doing the three courses next to the vent at six and an eighth inch so that I would end up with that little bit of a gap between the top of the vent and the shingles so water doesn't sit in there. Then I went to six and a half inches up to the top of the window, which again gave me that half inch gap between the window and the drip cap. Then I stretched out the courses to six and three quarters of an inch to reach the peak. And changing in those small little increments between courses is totally fine and it's impossible to see with the naked eye. It's much better to do that than ending up with a course that is really small or too tall somewhere. 
Then I decided to rent a Skylift with a man cage because it was getting way too scary and unstable up on my ladder jacks. They were fine up to about 10 to 12 feet, but then they became very unsafe and unstable. And this thing was literally a lifesaver. I just wish I would have rented it a lot sooner. It would have made this project go much faster. Well, I am incredibly happy with how this turned out. It really transformed this pole barn and added a ton of beauty. I love the warm color of the cedar and I'm really glad that I took the extra time to add that protective Valspar transparent stain so that it will stay that beautiful color. Well, everyone, I hope this video was helpful and gave you the confidence to add cedar shingles to your building. And I wanna thank Valspar again for sponsoring this video and thank you for watching. We'll see you on the next one.